Hey, guys and girls, good morning. It's theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. This is the beginning of day two of our coverage of Snowflake Summit. Lisa Martin here with Dave Vellante, George Gilbert. They're going to be connecting the dots of Snowflake's roadmap. They did a great breaking analysis piece last week. If you haven't seen it, we're going to be double clicking into that now. Dave, George, good morning. Good to see right. you guys. Yeah, it's quiet in here because everybody's in the keynotes. Everyone's still in the keynote. Right. We're going to be talking about the future of enterprise data apps. Dave, kick us off. What's the overall summary of the breaking analysis that you and George just published. Well, George and I started, we've collaborated for many years, but we really started upping our game in the last several months. And we started with, with, with taking a deep dive into dat Databricks and looking at their stack and some of the potential disruption scenarios there. And then we, we, we took that to the next level with Snowflake. We did a lot of research and tried to better understand what to expect here without any hints. We had no NDAs from, from Snowflake, but we did have a lot of discussions with customers and other executives and technologists. And then we also went way ahead to the future with Uber. We had Uday uh, um, Kieran Midisetti on to look at the future of data apps as the combination of people, places, and things, and the digital representation of your business, the digital twin, if you will, and how do you turn that into something that the database would understand in real time, you know, at scale. And so we sort of trying to lay out what the landscape looks like, and I, I guess I would say this, George, this notion at the high level of all data, all workloads is kind of the high level messaging that you get from the likes of Frank Slootman. You know, very good, very strong, uh, very powerful. Uh, but, and when you talk to the technical people, you go deep, they really are solid. They give you a sense as to how they did this, built this platform. The challenge that we've had, I think that many people have is, when you listen to their product announcements, it's a very stovepipe. It's ironic that they're trying to break down all these silos, these data silos, but they're, their middle messaging, their product messaging is very, very stovepipe and it's sometimes hard to connect the dots. It's like, on the one hand, it's great that we get the fire hose of announcements from, from Christian Kleinerman, but it, they don't do a great job of describing their real advantage, George, which is the integration. So maybe you could take a stab at that. So, you teed this up perfectly because if I wanted to take a before and after image, the before image would be like Amazon Web Services when Werner Vogels got up 18 months ago at, at reInvent and he puts up the slide of all 200 Amazon services and he's like, you know, you guys are telling us this is complicated but it's your fault. You asked for all this choice and power. And what Snowflake is doing is taking that slide and integrating all those capabilities so you're not trying to stuff together a bunch of piece parts that didn't fit. Now, to be specific, you know, Benoit started out by saying, look, from day one we built this data flow engine. It wasn't a SQL data warehouse. It was a, a data flow engine that could have multiple personalities to talk to it, and that it in turn could talk to multiple data types. And that, in a, in a nutshell, is their huge value add because no one else really has that. And just to elaborate, really quickly, so they started with SQL, then they added data frames, so all Python programmers, which now may be more numerous than SQL programmers, they can access the same capabilities. Um, then they're teasing out search, this was the Neva acquisition, so that you can talk, talk in natural language, and underneath it can generate a SQL query. It can also generate um, a query to talk to documents. Um, and then pull the, the query result together and integrate it. Um, then there is um, uh, another way of, of talking to the data is the, uh, the traditional like scikit-learn, the old, the old um, supervised machine learning libraries. Um, but then there's another one which the, they, they showed with NVIDIA where with generative AI and, and some packaged um, machine learning models that NVIDIA has. Which would be NLP. Yes, the, the NLP, but, but also stuff like recommenders, um, so that out of the box you can do really, really advanced models. So let me stop you for a second, because yeah. this is complicated for a yeah. lot of people, me included. So you have many ways to query the data. You've, you've got SQL, which is classic, that's kind of where they started. You said data frames. Explain what data frames are. Data frames are more forgiving than SQL. The data frame is the way Python programmers kind of they talk to their data to find out what's in there and to explore it and to clean it. Um, it's more forgiving, but 
a data frame can generate SQL, but it's a different interface. Okay, and then Neva gives you search, yeah. and, and you the ability to search documents, they showed a lot of that today. But it's not just documents, yesterday. but Neva right. can then generate a SQL query, so you can talk in nat natural language, but it can come, out can come a precise SQL okay, query. Okay, so in natural language, out in, in, in language that that a database will understand like yeah. SQL, which is you know, very flexible. Uh, and then supervised machine learning libraries, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of Databricks strength. Right, right, right. And Databricks, Databricks was built to a whole tool chain and language for supervised machine learning, to clean the data, to do the feature engineering, to train the models, to serve the models. And then what, what we learned from NVIDIA talking to Christian and then the head of enterprise um, at NVIDIA was that basically there, this is a whole reset because we're, we're doing a, a generational transition from uh, supervised machine learning, the traditional way, to um, generative AI is unsupervised or trains itself basically. Okay, so you got many ways to query. Yeah. Now let's talk about the many data types, what you I think referred to as pluggable storage. Yeah. Ex Explain what that means. And now, Snowflake will talk in terms of unstructured, semi-structured, and structured data. But the technology beneath that, I mean, everybody understands that, which is good that they communicate at that level. But, but to make it work, you know, there's specifics around da different database types, different storage types. Explain the various options that exist there that so they've supported. Even with structured data, you, when, when you want to do analytics, you know, slice and dice, you store it one way in columnar format. But when you want to do transactions, and, and they're, I guess, close to shipping that one, you store Unistore. It. Unistore. Yeah. We're waiting for Unistore. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> waiting for Godot and <laughs> Unistore. Yeah, right. So you, you store that in rows, but it's, it's a very different database beast. It's not just a reorganization. So that's one, that's, those are two pluggable storage types. So wait, sorry. Rows and columns. Rows and columns, right, so yeah. Analytics and OLAP, I right. mean, OLAP and, and, and transactions. transactions. And th that's no mean feat, but they're, to that they're adding, um, they can now like pull in streaming data and land it in a table, um, and then they can join across these different table types with dynamic tables, which you know, could up, be updated from a stream and updated from reference data. That, that's very powerful. And then they're adding vector data, which is um, when you bring in documents, you want to shred them and you want to turn them into a format that's machine readable. And a vector database example would be Pinecone, right? That's something that's that they- That's a vector they, database, they, yeah. and then th they can also do vector search. It, vector database is more full featured. Okay. So yes, that's another version. And then, um, and then there's graph data, which is like when you want to do customer 360 or, or security or, or supply chain, you want all the links in the data preserved. You don't want to flatten it into a table. R relational AI would be example yes. of a, that's a kind of a hybrid but it's, it's stored database. as a graph, right, but it right, just right. can do so, joins. So that means that it's more expressive than yes. you get with the traditional relational. But the problem with, with graph databases is, is you don't have the query flexibility, and that's what relational AI right. is trying to solve. Right, exactly. Okay, so we've got uh, OLAP, we've got uh, uh, OLTP slash transaction data, streaming. Uh, it sounds like they're actually creating another data type when they do these joins with dynamic table. That's like sort of a... Well, it's that, that it, it the result is one relational table, but it's pulling from different table okay, types. Okay, so it's, it, it's, it's relation, it ends, it ends it up ends, in relational yes. form, yeah. but the magic is that they're able to pull from those different yes. types, and then vector, then graph. Okay, so you've got many ways to query, you've got many data types. Okay, setup question. Well, so does Amazon. <laughs> that yeah. is a setup question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so go back to, Ve um, to Werner's slide with the 200 services. Now just take out the 12 operational databases, not that analytic databases, there's like just 12 operational, operational databases. Yeah. And, and each one has a programming model, each one has data for its own data format. In fact, the data format is, is bolted inside the database. Here, the, the data formats are are increasingly open, so that there are multiple ways to get at them, and then you know, so you f there you would have to extract, you know, reformat and import to move between just the operational databases. Then you've got the analytic databases. They don't even tie the data lake and and data warehouse together all that well. The the one thing I will say though here that, that there's one wrinkle in the story, and it's it's not really it's not a technical wrinkle. It's that if you want to put all your data in the in the data cloud um, and then operate on it through their engine, there is a, um, 
a compute cost, there's overhead, and with their markup of the infrastructure, some customers are finding that expensive. So let's explain this. So, so Snowflake, uh, like, very Amazon-like, they want you to put all the data into the Snowflake data cloud, and the reason is, and the value for the customers, if you do that, Snowflake can promise the governance and the security and all the, irrespective of which partner is there, as long as they're conforming to that Snowflake standard, just like the, the App Store, right. that's the analogy. The, the, the problem you're saying is that if you do that and you do the compute and all, what, all the cleansing and the data engineering inside of Snowflake, it gets really, really expensive. Why would it be cheaper to do it elsewhere? Well, where else would you do it that would be cheaper? Would you do it on-prem? Would you do it in another you cloud? You could do it on-prem. or you, I think what, what's happening is people are doing it on S3 and they might have some special purpose tool that essentially does the data e ETL or ELT in in S3, because then it's just cheaper. Data prep in S3, and this is yep. why you still need folks like Informatica, right? right? Okay, or you know, other e e ETL vendors. Uh, uh, Matillion is another example of some folks we had on before. Okay, so that's the one little nit, and you've talked to some customers that have said, and even some partners that say, well, that's just, this is the reality, is we, we, we have to be really careful, especially in this day and age. Okay, so where's that leave us? Uh, uh, let me say it this way. There's, in my mind anyway, George, there's, let's call it four, let's call it five major platform players. You got three that are dominant in machine learning and AI. You've got uh, AWS, Google, and now Microsoft, given that they did the reach around with open AI, you know, brilliant business move. So those three, obviously, very, very popular, and they all have data platforms. And then you've got Snowflake and Databricks. So how do you see the, the horses on the track? Okay, so this is where, where it really did get interesting in the, in the last six to nine months, where um, Databricks was pretty much far and away the, the leader in, in the tool chain for supervised machine learning. They, they built the whole company around that. Um, and Amazon had a pretty good tool chain with SageMaker, but it was, a, you know, like Amazon, it's kind of disjointed. But, but the functionality of each piece was pretty good. Um, Google had a very good, coherent product line. Microsoft, this was weird. Microsoft stopped adding functionality to their machine learning tool set like two or three years ago. Because? I, well, we right, didn't you, know. You, you suspect. I, I, right. I, I, I thought something was odd, because it's too strategic for them to give up. So what they were doing was, they knew two or three years ago they were going to get serious about open AI and generative AI, and they said in true Microsoft fashion, look, we lost this generation, let's get a head start on the next generation. So it's not just that they did a deal with open AI, it's but that they built the new tool chain to support that. Okay, and, and so... so Oh, please carry through. Okay, so the Databricks, I looked at the Mosaic ML um, uh, uh, acquisition. I'm, I'm, when I read it, I, I was actually stunned because they didn't buy like a tool chain that, a, that corporates would really use to help build generative AI models. That's, the, that's like any scale, system, system software almost. It's one level above that or it's like a really thin piece of operating system software that helps you run these really large, long-running jobs to train models. Corporates don't do that. They fine-tune models. Corporates don't train models from scratch. So then that, that says that, that, that Databricks is targeting a different audience then for, for this, with this acquisition. Either that or they, they needed it so that um, they could train their own and then offer, f offer these to be fine-tuned by their customers. Training, training these from scratch is going to be done by like Bloomberg and maybe a couple dozen companies in the Department of Defense. That's not a mainstream you know, activity. You're going to take pre-trained ones and tune them and, and so Databricks needs um, tools for that. Now in fairness, so you're, you're actually headed to the Databricks conference. So you know, look, when you're at these conferences, like my friend Andy Terai says, these companies are really good at telling stories. And so you know, you get you have the bias, the recency bias. So I'm really, I'll be curious as, as to talk to you on Friday and see what you think about. Uh, what you learned at, at, at Databricks. But you had a question? Yeah, well you guys in the breaking analysis that's on siliconangle.com, you talked about the presence of Databricks in Snowflake accounts and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Talk about maybe the synergies there that some of that you, you did a great compare and contrast, but obviously customers, Snowflake customers are using Databricks and vice versa. So tr prior to the, um, to the battle between these two companies, I'll just say, uh, the new workload that was emerging was you had AWS cloud infrastructure and you had Snowflake 
data warehouse at the time, simplified data warehouse, and you had Databricks machine learning and, and AI coming together as a new emergent workload. This is probably 2015, 16, 17 in that time frame. And we thought at the time that that was sort of this new ecosystem forming, but then you know, both Databricks and Snowflake raised boatloads of, of money and realized that TAM is a lot larger. And so now what you have is, is Snowflake with very strong data management, simplified data cloud, data warehouse, moving up you know, to, to, to applications, a super cloud, et cetera, and trying to get into machine learning and data, data engineering, data science, You've heard a lot of announcements here to that respect. At the same time, you have uh, Databricks from that ML AI data engineering heritage getting into the traditional space of analytics and, and data warehouse with, with Lakehouse and you know, their other capabilities. So the overlap is very high in those accounts. It's, it's higher, there are more Snowflake accounts inside Databricks accounts, but that's because there's more Snowflake accounts out there than the reverse, uh, but, there's, but in both cases, very, very high overlap, you know, 30, 40% type of overlap. So I, I would add to that that they're not complete substitutes yet. Right. That the, the, the Python functionality that Snow, Snowflake has shown still needs to mature, like where we got a heads up that they might be doing something along the lines of what Ponder has done with a complete Pandas API running on Snowflake. As soon as, as, soon as um, that's available as an Anaconda library, any customer can use that. But um, right now, Snowpark is not as fully featured for doing like the data engineering pipelines um, as, as, um, as um, Databricks, and there, there's, there's, the other thing is that because Databricks runs on a data lake, um, the compute cost and the compute overhead of doing your data engineering, the, the um, pipelines, the ETL, ELT, it's cheaper still on Databricks, which is why you might still see overlap. Ah, to your earlier point, yes. if you do it inside of Snowflake, it gets more expensive. Right. So, so there again, Databricks, very interesting company. But you, we talked about we, we talked about the key elements of their stack in the piece that that we wrote. You, you sort of helped us frame that: the Delta Lake, the Spark Execution Engine, the Photon, which is the the BI warehouse, and the AI ML tool chain, tool chain which is their their wheelhouse. And you know, so the the core capability, some of the strengths and weaknesses, and and, and the threats to each of those. And the conclusion was. Uh, there are a lot of disruptions potentially coming at them. So they've got a lot of critical decisions to make. Now, I actually have a lot of confidence in that their team is very good and they'll make whatever acquisitions they need to make and they'll evolve that. They've got a lot of resources, they've got a lot of loyal customers, but this sort of it sets up this really interesting battle. But I want to bring in AWS and Google because I'll point out that, that AWS for years has sort of copied some of Snowflake's move. They separated compute from storage as an example which really was kind of a bolt-on, if you, if you recall. Um, and, uh, and, and so you really can't shut down, for instance, the compute, you know? You can kind of dial it down. You, and they did that by tiering, you know, to tiering the less active storage. But it was, again, I mean, it was based upon, you know, an on-prem stack that they, they licensed perpetually. Not perpetually, they basically bought it out. Right. Uh, what was the company they-, they PowerXL. Uh, PowerXL, right. Yeah. And, um, and then, and now Google, on the other hand, has a native, cloud native, you know, data platform with, with BigQuery. You know, Google, the thing about Google, I'd love your thoughts on both of those companies. They want to keep the others out. They want to kind of force customers to use their ML. If you want Google AI, you kind of got to use BigQuery, right? So they're, they're more, so Snowflake will tell you they're more expensive in GCP. And that's, I think, by design. Um, it, it's, it's like, you know, Oracle is more expensive in, in Amazon, so. If you're going to be on GCP, you're very well served using BigQuery and the Vertex whole AI tool chain. Yeah. In fact, that, those are the main reasons to use GCP. Right. That, it's, that's it. Yeah, so, so that's, not, that's why I don't think Snowflake has a ton of momentum in GCP. They do have momentum in Microsoft. Yeah. It, it, explain why. Why would Microsoft be a, a better fit? Because Microsoft, well, for, for one, GCP doesn't have much um, presence in the enterprise. They're just, they, they never had a big footprint. They're, they're a consumer company for the most part. They're Even with SQL Server? 
Uh, no, I'm talking about GCP. Oh, oh yeah, 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 and, yeah, 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 sorry. And then with, with Microsoft, their data platform in Azure was always fragmented. And this is the first time with um, Fabric and, uh, Fabric and Syn yeah. Synapse as the core engine that they at least standardized the table format, but the they standardized on Delta tables. And the reason they did that is because Databricks had something like 40% of all VMs running on Azure were Databricks, meaning all the data on Azure was belong to Databricks, so Microsoft is trying to co-opt you know, that data and say, use our analytic engines, and we'll partner with Databricks, you know, we'll, so that between the two of us, we'll try and get everyone into Delta tables, and then we'll compete on the quality of our analytic engines. So that's, that's their play, but neither of them have you know, this core engine that Snowflake has, which is, you know, we can handle all your analytic types and all your operational workloads. That, that's an integration level where where Snowflake has gone one level above, not just the, the data format, but now the engines. So, Monday night, uh, Frank Slootman interviewed uh, Jensen Wong from uh, NVIDIA, and the next day the stock you know, popped, went up three and a half, four percent. I don't know, I wasn't at Investor Day, I think it was yesterday, so whatever Frank and Mike Scarpelli said, impressed investors, it's up again another seven points today, the stock's up four percent. So they liked what they heard, even though the ETR data shows a, 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 a smaller percentage of new logos currently, a higher percentage of those customers that are spending flat, and even a, even a higher percentage of those customers spending less or defecting, the, their, their churn is still very, very small, but the red is, is growing, the gray, which is flat the spend, red, the, is the red is churn. Is, is churn and, sp and or spend less. Oh, okay. The gray, which is sp spending flat, is, is growing pretty noticeably, uh, the green, which is spending more, is declining, it's compressing, and the, the bright green, which is new logos, is definitely is down to like 15%, whereas it was much higher. Now, I know, it just in, in listening and observing these guys, they don't incentivize this, and I could ask Frank Slipman this, they don't incentivize their sales teams on new logos. They incentivize them on finding companies, their, their incentive is essentially consumption, right? They have a consumption model if they can incentivize their, their customers, their reps and their customers to consume, that's a goodness. Which, I don't know if that's a blind spot or not. I mean, I think, I, my feeling, George, is when the economy picks up again and people are just more comfortable that organically they'll get more, you know, new logos. However, to your point, there's competition. And, and but the competition now is within an account like maybe we go back to the old model where you used something like Hadoop to do the pipeline and get the data ready, and then you used the data warehouse or now the data platform for doing the interactive query or now applications. But there's a big business in, in the data pipeline, and that's, a, that's where their cost, not, they're not really cost competitive. Okay, now come back to roadmap. Um, so connect the dots, so we have this, yeah. we have many ways, we have this, this, this all data, all workloads, um, a, a platform, you have many data types, many ways to query, the magic is it's all integrated. So where does it go from here? Okay, so this was where the analyst day was really helpful, um, especially when we got to talk to some of the product guys, you know, whether it was Benoit or Christian or, or Chris Child. And right now, they're consolidating really their hold on all the data management functionality. They're sort of reclaiming the glory days of, of Oracle, where it's you know, managed not only all your operational data, but you know, all your analytic data. Of course they bristle at that example, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's true. But, yeah. but it, Oracle, I, I refer to that in a, in a good sense. They dominant, that, yeah, dominant, right? They won right. the war. Of, but what Oracle never did was they never got to the next level, which was to be the platform for applications. No, they just bought the applications and yes, ran them but, on their but, own but platform. But before that, like, so what SAP and, and right. PeopleSoft did was they built their own application servers and they put the application logic in that layer. Right. And BEA came along and you put your application logic in that layer for, for web apps. What, what Snowflake doesn't want to let happen is an application platform to emerge above them. And they know this is an issue. They're taking care of the data first, but they, they realize that to the issue we've been talking about. They semantic need the semantic layer. layer. Yeah. They need a workflow model that's really rich because then, then they know how to translate from what a developer talks about, what you started with, which is the people, places, things, and the database knows about strings. And the, it's the 
the platform engine that optimizes the difference and translates between things and strings. So those people, places, things, that digital twin of your business, they could be represented by many, many data types. Unstructured, rows, columns, documents, ve vector data, knowledge graphs, et cetera. But that translation. And, and, and then the semantic layer uh, creates that translation right. so that all those data elements are coherent. Right. And the owner of that semantic layer is going to be a very powerful lever. If it's inside a snowflake, then right. they're going to maintain control. If it's not inside a snowflake and it's, it's a third party, then that data is going to be accessible to a, a, a lot of other folks. Now, it won't necessarily have the governance and security uh, uh, promise that Snowflake delivers, but it will be available in a coherent fashion. You could, and Snowflake doesn't want to let that happen, I would presume. You could implement the governance at the application layer. Ah. And this is what okay. relational AI, this was... Which would create more stovepipes. Um, well, no, because of the semantic layer would... They would, would be, would, they would be would, the would unifying layer. They would be the unifying layer. They would be the unifying layer. Okay, so, so one of the comments you, you've made to me is that, um, and you've, I think, evolved your thinking on this, is, is your inference was that Snowflake are thinking like database people, which of course, <laughs> they came out of Oracle, the other database, but as you speak, as we speak to more people, it's obvious that they're bringing in talent that has more of an application mindset, not sort of a database mindset. Is that right. a fair yes. assertion? I think, I think that the, the mindset to date has been, let's get all the data and manage it. Yeah. And now it's like, okay, so what do we need to do next? Wow. That was a master class in breaking down the breaking analysis. Published on siliconangle.com. Just search for Snowflake Summit breaking analysis. You'll find it, it's the top link. Dave, you've got Frank Slootman coming. We've got a great lineup of Snowflake uh, executives, customers, partners. We're going to be digging into all sorts of things today. Dave, what are you looking forward to with your one-on-one -on -one with Frank Slootman who's coming on in about an hour? I want to know what happened to Investor Day, what he said. I, I, I can't believe he said anything new, but, but an Investor Day, and you can, it's available, it's all public information, you can watch it, but they get open. They talk a little bit about the competition and they talk about why they feel like they've got the right point of view. So I want to understand what's happened there and I want to uh, test this thesis a little bit that you've got the top level messaging, which is right on. You've got the, the technical uh, foundation, which is extremely solid and then sort of what's missing is that middle piece and, and make sure that we are understanding this correctly. I want to get Frank's point of view on that. All right, that sounds great. We want to thank you for watching our Connect the Dots of Snowflake's roadmap. Up next, we have a full day of coverage on theCUBE for you, as I mentioned. We've got Amanda Kelly from Streamlit coming on with customer PowerSchool. They're going to be talking about how Streamlit is helping PowerSchool to really transform the K-12 experience from the front office to the classroom to the home. As I mentioned, the breaking analysis published on siliconangle.com, as is all of our analysis and editorial content. And of course, you can find all of our CUBE content from Snowflake and other events on theCUBE.net. We'll see you in a few minutes with our next guest. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech event coverage.